Good. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Fine. <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for coming out again uh, to our second talk uh, for what we've called the Harvest Lecture uh, Series. So uh, I'm actually really excited uh, tonight to hear from Larry, but just wanted to, before we start, remind you of our kind of the schedule again for the next uh, a couple times. So the next lecture is going to be on the 29th. I don't have the slide up here, um, but just mark that down. Uh, this, uh, November 29th, so that's a Wednesday. That's two weeks from now, I think it is. Today's the 15th, right? So two weeks from now, we'll hear from David Gibson on uh, relationships. And the, the title of, of his talk is going to be, What I Learned About Relationships from the Life of David. So it should be interesting. David had a, uh, a whole plethora of relationships, some of them good, some of them bad. So I think uh, there's probably going to be a little bit of both in the talk. So that'll be in two weeks. Uh, but tonight, we are going to uh, hear about prayer. And the title of the talk tonight is, Does Prayer Really Matter? And it could be a very, very, very short talk depending on how he answers it, right? It could be yes or no, and then we might be able to go home early. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but the, the topic actually kind of comes out of a, a little bit of a, you might say, a paradox, I guess, in the Bible. Um, on the one hand, you have verses like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, which says, pray without ceasing, right? Or uh, like in Philippians chapter 4, uh, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So the Bible certainly tells us that we should pray and we should let our requests be made known to God, that we should pour out our heart to the Lord. But then on the other hand, you have passages like, I just pulled one out, a couple, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, for example. Verse, thir verse 13, Isaiah says, Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom does God consult, and who made him understand? So the, the idea there is that God doesn't take any counsel from anybody, right? He doesn't need us to say, hey, I think you should do X, Y, and Z, you know, in this area. God doesn't need any counsel. Or, or uh, Psalm 115, verse 3 is even a little bit uh, more direct, I guess. He says, uh, the psalmist says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. So on the one hand, God does what he pleases. And on the other hand, the scriptures tell us, pour out your heart, pray without ceasing, make your requests made known unto God. So that's kind of what uh, I think spurred this uh, talk and this uh, um, lecture, I guess. How does all that work, right? How does, does prayer, like, really matter? How, how does it work? So Larry's going to tackle that a problem, or not problem, but the topic, I guess, uh, for us uh, tonight. So I'm, I'm excited to hear what he has to say about that. And uh, just a, a word about Larry, in case you don't know him, him and his wife, Audrey, uh, have been coming to our church for about nine years, I guess. So I guess a uh, pretty good amount of time, uh, especially considering how many new folks we have been coming to the church. And um, they've, been him, they've been married for nearly 40 years. Pretty impressive. At, he's only 50. Just kidding. <laughs> you can do the math for his age. Uh, but uh, I asked him to do a lecture on prayer, actually, be, actually, because last spring he actually taught a Faith Academy class on prayer. So I thought he'd be uh, uh, somebody that'd be fitting to talk about this. He's thought about this topic. And um, so I'm excited to hear what he has to say about it. A couple words about him. Uh, he says he was saved when he was in high school, actually, which, which is interesting. It's, I, I think it's always interesting to hear about people who have been saved a little bit later on in life. And uh, since then, uh, really developed a love for the word of the Lord. And I think you, you see, you'll see that come out just in, 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 in how much I've talked to him. I just really can tell that he 
does have a love for uh, the Word of God. He's even studied uh, Greek some and done some Greek studies. He's a Navy veteran, a photojournalist, a small business consultor, and a teacher all packaged into one. So uh, that's pretty cool. And they have two children, two granddaughters, and he promises that he'll show us pictures of, the, of his granddaughters. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say. So Larry, come on up. Let me pray for you, and then uh, we'll hear from you. He's got a handout, too. I can pass those out if you like. Not right now. Okay, when you tell me. Let, me. let me pray for us and for Larry, and then uh, we'll start. Father God, thank you for another day that we have. Thank you that we can come to a church w- that preaches your word and that teaches your word. And I just pray you be with Larry now. Help him to have clarity. Help us to listen and to hear from you on this important topic of prayer. And I know for myself it's a topic that I need more instruction in. And I need to be a, a better prayer warrior. So I pray that this talk tonight would help us and that we would ultimately turn to you more and cast our requests even more onto you as a result of what we hear tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Good evening. How are you guys doing? Lovely. Don't you like this kind of late Indian summer, easier... No ice to have to walk on to get here. How many of you older folks love ice? Just, no, okay. (laughs) So, um, I'll mute the thing here. They got all sorts of really interesting stuff up here, but I'm gonna avoid the interesting stuff. Well, I've been teaching for a long time various venues. I um, taught Bible studies in college, which was a long time ago, (laughs) Uh, in the early 70s to be exact. I'll let you do the math. Uh, And uh, uh, I was a journalist for many years and and done a lot of different things, but the thing that I have the, the greatest heart for, the greatest passion for is God. Um, my utter joy is to know the Lord and to walk intimately with Him. And therefore, my great joy is to engage with folks um, to they would also um, uh, discover a rich, full life in Jesus. Not just mere salvation, but a rich, abundant life. And we'll talk about that tonight. Um, I'm going to, uh, um, we're going to focus on the heart of prayer. There's a lot of questions about prayer and a lot we can decide. Um, But I want to focus on the heart of prayer because that's the beginning. That's the the whole starting place, the basis place, if you will. And um, other issues we can can discuss as we go along. So, Binge said the title is, Does Prayer Really Matter? And I'm going to give a resounding yes. So, good night. Y'all have a good evening. (laughs) But, uh, which begs the question, why? Why does prayer matter? Um, You know, God is sovereign. He, He knows long before we ask him anything, um, and so, why do we need to ask him? Well, because he asks us to. We're going to hand those at the end. Okay? So just hang on to them, Ben. Thank you. Um, so, because he wants us to. He knows what he's doing. And, he's, and he delights to answer our prayers in his way for our good. And it works together in some sort of fashion that's kind of beyond us. It's like, you know, free will and predestination, which, you know, trumps the other, pun not intended. Uh, uh, but the, um, which, you know, sort of forces the other one. Um, I don't know. I'm not God. Um, like Ben says, we're, we don't advise him. We don't tell him what to do. We don't uh, explain to him uh, the intricacies of life. Um, we live the intricacies of life with him. So, um, 
So prayer is not only matters, prayer is vital, absolutely vital. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so we're going to look at Jesus' teaching on prayer. There's lots of places we can go in Scripture, uh, but we're going to focus on this passage in Luke 18. So if you turn to Luke 18, that's where we're going to focus our time. So let me read this to us, or for us. Yeah, it says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He also told them this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, said Jesus, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, it's our privilege to look into your word and to study the, uh, what Jesus had to say about prayer. Um, and, I, and I must confess, I feel completely unworthy, uh, unable um, to give justice to this text, to give justice to you. Um, you're so sovereign and great and mighty and good and beyond um, anything I could even conceive. And yet you call me, you call us to yourself. You condescend to hear us, to delight to hear us. Um, so I ask you now, Lord, to just uh, take our time, um, bring our thoughts to Jesus, um, uh, draw us to yourself. Um, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I was telling my wife as we were driving over, um, deep down inside where this old man lives, I love the Lord Jesus. But my public persona is, uh, as I would describe it, a bit bozoid. Uh, that might be a new term for you. How many of you remember Bozo the Clown? Yeah, okay, well, I'm a bozo, or as I would uh, prefer to say it, I'm a bozoic character. I invented the word, so anyway. Um, so uh, um, we will, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just dive in here, and, and uh, part of it is that normally when I teach, I teach about 30 or 40 in a room, and I can be kind of down at your level, but they want to record this, so I need to be up here. So they gave me this little thing to use, which I, anyway, so it's a little bit, what am I doing? Uh, so anyway, this teaching on prayer that Jesus gives is a, is a, is a two parables, and it's a, it's a contrast. Jesus is contrasting real prayer with non-real prayer, phony prayer. 
Um, and it's a series of contrasts that we'll go through. And the first contrast is between praying and not praying. And Jesus immediately tells us his point on why he's telling us, why he's giving these parables on prayer. And Luke says, and he told them a parable to the effect that they had always to pray and not lose heart. So Jesus, the master prayer, puts prayer on an either or basis. Either you're praying or you're fainting. If you're fainting, you're not praying. If you're praying, you won't be fainting. He puts it on an either or basis. Pretty sharp contrast. So he then, uh, by the way, the, uh, I like uh, so sometimes the uh, different translations capture the sense of the Greek. And the, the King James uses the word faint. Uh, I like that. Come discouraged. You can't know, you like just faint. Uh, there's a, I believe it's in Zephaniah, where the prophet uses the expression, don't let your hands fall limp. You know, you ever get that feeling where just, oh, like, it's no use. Um, that's what I think captures the sense of this here. Then he tells this parable um, about um, the uh, contrasting a widow and a judge. He says, there's this widow, and this widow has some sort of issue with somebody. Uh, call it, they, they call it um, an adversary. But uh, what the issue was, we don't know. doesn't matter. But she's got an issue with this person. And so she goes to this judge re requesting justice, requesting him to help her solve this problem with this person. And the judge refuses. She's just a widow. He doesn't seem to care about her. And, it, and note it says that um, he says, though I neither fear God nor respect man. I don't fear God. It's a godless judge. And I don't respect men. So there's no political pressure, no social pressure she can put on this man. There's no moral or biblical religious pressure she can put on this man. Uh, from the, from the widow's perspective, her case is totally hopeless. Forget it. Give it up. I'm sure her friends probably told her that several times. But she continues and continues and persists, almost badgering this guy. And finally he says, oh, enough. Enough. Okay, I'll settle your case. Just quit bugging me. Okay, because he says, I don't want her to, to, to beat me down, literally, uh, beat, beat him up. Um, so he says he'll give, he'll, he'll answer her request. So what is Jesus doing here? Well, he's contrasting, okay, he's contrasting this widow, this helpless widow, okay, with, uh, with this unrighteous judge. Okay, and, he's, and Jesus is, is saying she was persistent, and she won her case because she was persistent. So let, let's dig a little further, because this is important. Okay? Um, so it's, it's a contrast between the widow and judge and her persistence and her unwillingness. But there's a deeper contrast here, and that is between the judge and God, between our Father. Because Jesus says, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, okay, we'll do that verse later. Um, so what, what Jesus is saying is the unrighteous judge is not, isn't, we're not comparing him to God. We're contrasting him with God. The, the unrighteous judge was unrighteous. He was wicked. God is not unrighteous. God is not wicked. So we, we, want, we want to catch that first of all. There's a contrast there. Um, God, um, God is not begrudging. God is not um, uh, uh, withholding. He wants us to come and pray. I know there's lots of mysteries about prayer, but 
Cut to the chase, God wants us to pray. Okay, he's willing, he's excited, he's happy for us to pray. Okay, um, so if you, go to, if you look over at Matthew 6, uh, and I'll have a handout for you, which will have these verses. But in Matthew 6, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Did I write down the wrong verse? I may have done that. That's very definitely possible. Uh, I'm looking for the one that's about uh, ask and you'll receive. Oh, seven, seven, seven. Matthew 7, 7, ask and you receive. Verse 9 says, or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Um, he's, he's, he's not grudging he delights to give. Um, he's happy to give. Um, but he wants us to ask. Um, there's another contrast here, too, between the widow and judge, between the judge and God, and there's a contrast between the activity of the widow and the activity of God's children. She badgered and badgered and badgered the judge. Okay. God is not begrudging. He doesn't ask us to badger him and badger him and badger him. You know, he says he'll give justice speedily. And over in Matthew, it says that he's, you know, if if you're evil and give good gifts to your child, how much more will your father give good gifts to those who ask him? Okay, God is not begrudging. God is happy to give. There is an old-fashioned not sure we, how much we may do it nowadays, but there's an old-fashioned kind of prayer called prevailing prayer. And when you go to God and you just you, you pray and you pray and you pray, it's like you pick at the throne of heaven. You know, you badger God with your request until he finally relents and gives you your request. Okay? That, that's not biblical. We don't have that kind of God that we have to just badger him or... or um, um, uh, you know, try to force him to do something that, that, that he doesn't want to do. As I say, he's happy uh, and thrilled to give to us. So, um, the next parable, we're going to skip the last verse on that about um, when the Son of Man comes part. We'll come back to that. Um, there's another parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, uh, the, the, Luke also says that Jesus, he said he told the parable of the one and the judge that we ought always to pray in all his heart. And then here he says that he told this because some trusted in themselves. They were righteous and had contempt for others. But this parable needs to be taken with, this, with the one above it because it's about prayers. You might call this prayer, parable the parable of the two prayers. Because it's about two men that pray. And one comes into the temple, very sure of himself, very confident. And he says, "Um, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. So his basis of prayer was his self-worth. His religiosity, his education, the fact that he was a Pharisee. So he's standing before God, and he's asking God for something, and he's saying, God, you want to give it to me because I've done this, and I've you know, c- contributed here, and I've obeyed you, and I've been a Pharisee, and I've done this, and I've done that. Okay? And is that any basis to stand before God and pray? 
Do, do any of us have, have any worth of our own that we could stand before God and demand that God gives us X and so? No, no. And Jesus contrasts him with the Pharisee, with the tax collector. In the old version is the publican, not the Republican, the publican. And so this, this tax collector, which was despised in that culture, because he was working for the Romans, taxing the people, many times overtaxing the people on the behalf of Rome. And they were despised by their own people. And he slips into the temple, you know, tries not to hope anybody sees him, but he slips into the temple and he's beating his breast. And he's saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he had nothing to stand upon. He had nothing to offer God. He had no righteousness on his own. He had no good works on his own. He had nothing to stand before God. Nothing. And he came and confessed to God. And Jesus says he's the one that went down to his house justified, not the other guy. Okay. Um, so when we stand and pray... Um, it's not about us and our worth. It's not about us and our badgering God. It's about our, our just our coming to a Father who loves us. Um, each of you pray, I'm sure. Each of you have lives. Each of you go to the Father and Pray, ask for something, thank him, confess things. Um, and what is the basis of our coming to him? Do we have anything to offer? Okay. We'd have nothing. The only thing we can stand upon is his fatherliness to give. Um, prayer... Very simply, is three things. Again, I got handouts for you. Our binge actually has the handout. Three things. Prayer is three things. The first thing prayer is, is an awareness of need. Something in your life you need. A job. Patience. Okay. Uh, it might be a, a, a medical issue. It might be some sort of social issue. A friend you can't get along with. But whatever it is, it's a need. You're aware of this need. And so you go to God in prayer. And the second thing that prayer is, it's a realization of divine adequacy to meet our need. So our need drives us to the one who can meet that need. Otherwise, we wouldn't be going to him in the first place. He is God. He delights to give. He can meet our needs. And that's why we want to go to him and pray. There's one more issue with prayer, one more thing about prayer, and that is this. Prayer is just not some cry. Oh, God, help me. Oh, like, you know, just sort of this cry from our hearts that we're, we don't really know if God can help us or not. And that's not prayer. So prayer is an awareness of need. It's a realization of divine adequacy. And it's an expectation that our Father delights to bless us for our joy in his glory. He delights to give. So it says over and over and over again in the word. Okay, especially in the teaching of Jesus. He delights to give. He's happy to give. And so prayer is not only need and divine adequacy, but prayer is also an expectation that God's going to meet your need. In his way, his time, yes, but it's, he's going to meet your need. He's going to provide for you. He's not going to let you be adrift. He's not going to let you be like on your own, buddy, suck it up. You know, he's, going to, he's going to meet your need. And the thing he meets your need with first and foremost is his presence. This is presence that comes to you and says, I'm with you, okay? I'm going to get you through this, okay? 
I have a precious sister, um, a couple years younger than me. Um, she has a prayer ministry in, um, around the country, and especially in northern, in, uh, up in the mountains of Idaho. She lives in New Meadows right now. But she's been single her whole life. She has no husband. She has nobody to lean on. Okay? But she finds Jesus over and over and over again to be her sufficiency, to be her husband. Um, and I, that's a faith and a privilege that I don't have. But, but in her experience, she does. Um, so we have this widow and the judge. We have the contrast between the badgeriness of the widow and the judge is he's unrelenting uh no 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 um which contrasts our father and our relationship with our father and then we have this contrast between the pharisee and the tax collector where one's basis for prayer is his self-worth and the other's basis for prayer is nothing but god's grace and god's mercy um, and right in the middle of it is this, um, this eighth verse says, um, the second, this, funny we have a verse there, but there's actually two different sentences, but the verse numbers came after the writing. Uh, the last little sentence says, nonetheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So Jesus is saying, God delights to give, God will give speedily, nonetheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? It's a strange thought. He doesn't say, because he's been talking about prayer, he doesn't say, when the Son of Man comes, will he, find, will he find prayer on earth? He's been talking about prayer. You'd expect that. But he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So Jesus is alluding to a connection between faith and and prayer. Okay. He said in the beginning, you pray or you're going to faint. And in the end, he's saying, or in the middle here, he says, if you have faith, you will pray. Okay. If you're praying, you're exercising your faith. Okay. Because faith looks to the object of our faith, in this case, God, Jesus. Um, and believes in the validity of that object. Okay? Faith is just not some sort of, you know, like feeling or uh, idea. Faith is um, a trust in the validity of an object. Right now, all of you are experiencing faith. Every single one. You put your whole weight on that little pew or those pew chairs, as the case is. You're sitting there in that pew. I bet when you sat down, you didn't even think about it. But you're trusting in that pew to hold you up. You're exercising faith in the pew. Right? Right? Okay, you can nod your heads or something. So, um, so in the same way, because over the years, you've gotten to know pews. You've become acquainted with pews, Right? I mean, you come in here and you sit down. You get up and leave. You come in here and sit down. You get up and leave. Over the time, you've, these things will hold my weight. These things will hold me up. And so you just commit your weight to the pew. Well, it's the same thing with Jesus, with God. Look, if you don't know him, you're going to find it kind of difficult to trust him. How do I know I can trust him? Okay? Um, let's extend this just a bit. Let's say that... Um, uh, I was going to use my brother Chuck, but he's in a meeting about men's ministry tonight. Chuck is one of the leaders of the prayer ministry, and Chuck's a Navy veteran like myself. Back when I was in the Navy, back in the dark ages, when we had sales and stuff. No, I'm kidding. Um, back when I was in the Navy, they paid us cash. True. When we had payday, we would go uh, to the dispersing office and stand in line, and they would give us cash money. Your whole paycheck in cash, okay? Well, on, when you were in, in port, that was no problem. You take your cash and go down to the bank and deposit it in your checking account. But when we were at sea, so most guys would 
just sort of, I just need, you know, 20, 30 bucks to buy some, uh, you know, sodas and chips and peanuts and whatnot. And the Navy term is called gee dunk. All, all that stuff's called gee dunk. So anyway, so just enough to buy some gee dunk. So, um, uh, so, uh, but let's say that it's payday and we're, we're uh, uh, at import and I have duty that day. So I can't go to the bank. Okay, so, so I take and give my, ask Chuck, I'm going to give you my money because you bank at the same bank I do. I'm going to give you my money and you can take it to the bank for me and deposit it in my account. Now, why would I do that? Am I an idiot? Well, I might be, but never mind. Uh, it, it, because I know Chuck. Because I know he's a valuable, godly man. Because he's a trustworthy man. And I, and I believe that he will get my money in the bank for me. Okay? So it's the same way with Jesus. As we get to know Jesus and know that he's reliable, he can be trusted. We can commit our lives to him. So... Um, So, talking about this faith and practice a bit more, um, um, and kind of we'll drive it down here a bit more. Um, what, let me ask you a question. What, what is your view of the Christian life? How do you live the Christian life? Okay, well, I think most of us um, start off at some point uh, when we at some point, when we realize that um, we're sinners and we can't save ourselves. We've, we've gone to church, we've done this, we've done that. I, I grew up in church. Uh, I thought I was a pretty okay guy. Uh, and then when I was a junior in high school, it began to dawn on me that uh, maybe I'm not quite so good as I thought I am. Uh, in fact, that I'm really not that good at all. And, I, you know, if it's a matter of being righteous and good and all that stuff, I'm, I'm probably not going to make it. Matter of fact, I'm not going to make it. Uh, and I, I came to a point where I realized that. But I also understood from the preaching of the gospel that, <clears throat> that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. He came and died on that cross to take upon himself my death my deserved death for my, for my sin on himself so I could have new life. And I was like, that's just the greatest good news in the whole world. And I was ecstatic, okay? And so I came into the Christian life, like probably most of you, excited and, and ready to go and, and just excited about living it. And, um, um, but I realized, well, let me go back here a sec. So when we start off our Christian life, we begin in faith in Jesus that our sins are forgiven and we're going to get to go to heaven someday. Okay, or maybe the Lord will return and take us with him to heaven. Okay, but how do we live in the gap between? How do we live in, you know, between, yea, we're saved and someday will be saved completely, how do we live now? How do we live now? Well, what are you trusting in? What are you depending upon to live now? There's this, there's this concept called the abundant life. Anybody ever heard of the abundant life? Anybody ever? <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I went on to round that thing. Um... You know, I think a lot of us often feel like we're in Romans 7. You know, you, if you turn to Romans 7, there's some feedback or something, I don't know. Um... Verse 14, Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, 
For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, I mean, anybody ever feel like you live there? No? None of you? Oh, a few. Okay. Um, I think we all live there. I think that's where we all struggle. We all don't want to live there, but we all live there. Okay? Um, And down in verse 18, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. We have this desire in us, this want to, this will that wants to obey God, that wants to live close to God, that wants to walk with God. But we don't have in ourselves the ability to carry it out. Where's the ability come from? It comes from Jesus. It comes from the Lord. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Um, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to field here, but it's good. We'll bring it back. Do you hear my blowing into this? I don't normally use this, so. Can you hear me now? Okay. You still hear me? No? Yeah, but it was disconcerting to me. Okay, I'm okay. Okay, thank you, Adam. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Paul says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one a fragrance of death to death, to the other a fragrance of life to life. In that day and age when a Roman general would win a big victory, um, he would be afforded by earlier on the Senate and later by the emperor, he would be afforded what's called a triumph. And he would would parade through the town with his troops uh, and they would, you know, throw flowers and stuff and he'd kind of a nice accolade for job well done. Now, it's interesting because so you'd have these, these people in the front that were throwing flowers and then the soldiers would come marching uh, first and the Roman soldiers had those ironclad shoes, like the studded shoes, and they would crush those flowers and it would release this marvelous fragrance. Just You'd smell it, it's just this wonderful fragrance. And the Roman soldiers would be marching on, oh, smelling that fragrance, all that is just so wonderful. And behind them would come the general, and the general smelling this fragrance, and he's going, oh, that is just so wonderful. And the, the new prisoners <laughs> that were in the back were coming, and they'd smell the same fragrance. And it wasn't wonderful to them. They're like, oh, you know. Paul says, want an aroma from life to life, an aroma from death to death. And Paul says, we are like that fragrance. We are. God in us, we are like that fragrance. And then he asks an interesting question. He says, um, uh, the fragrance from death to death and other fragrance from life to life, who is sufficient for these things? Who? Who indeed is sufficient for these things? I'm not sufficient. Are you sufficient? He says in chapter 3, verse 4, but such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Okay. It's not our sufficiency, our worth, our character, our good deeds. It's the Spirit of God in us that is the sufficiency. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Okay. Um, Jesus said, go back to, if you go to John. Six. He 
John 6, 63, he said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. So remember back in Romans 7, okay? We don't have the ability. And Jesus says, the flesh is no help at all. It's the spirit who gives life. So let me, um, let me give us kind of a fun illustration. Um, um, I like illustrations because they, they're very helpful. They kind of bring things together. This is a silly illustration. This is a ridiculously silly illustration, but sometimes it's the ridiculously silly illustrations that you remember. So, so here is a white glove, very common white glove, okay? I think I bought this at Fred Meyer for like $3. <laughs> anyway, common little glove. Now, this glove represents me, represents you. It's been saved. It's been washed in the blood of the lamb. It's pure. It's white. It's holy. Isn't that great? So this glove really wants to obey God, really wants to serve its brothers and sisters. So, okay, so let's give the glove a simple task. Okay, so my brother Adam down here uh, is thirsty. I can tell he's thirsty. Aren't you thirsty yet? So anyway, Adam's thirsty. So I have here a glass of water. It happens to be a cup from, from uh, Chick-fil-A. It says it's the most wonderful time of the year. Yeah, it is too. So now, so we want to be able to give this water to Adam. So I'm going to tell the glove to give the water to Adam. So how's it doing? Well, not real well. Well, somebody comes along. Ben comes along and says, Larry, you idiot. You have to instruct the glove. It needs education. Okay, yeah, okay. So let's educate the glove. So glove, I want you to take your thumb and put it on this side and your fingers over here and squeeze real well and then pick up the, the, the water. No. So that didn't work. Still yeah, you're still, <laughs> Adam's still thirsty. So, well, oh, the glove needs discipline. Needs to be committed Needs to be disciplined, so let's discipline the glove. Come on, glove, get your act together, you glove. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. So, nope, still doesn't work. Well, okay, so somebody comes along and says, um, my wife comes along and says, well, Larry, the glove has a poor self image. Okay, it's defeated, it's discouraged, it needs to have a, feel better about itself. Okay, you're right. So, glove, just be encouraged. Believe in your inner gloveness. Come on, you can do this. I know you can. No, doesn't work. Well, you guys are probably already ahead of me. So, the glove designer designed the glove so that the glove would be filled with the life of another, namely my hand. And when my hand fills the glove, the glove has no problem. You don't want this. I've been drinking it. So uh, the glove has no problem picking up the, the cup and giving it to our brother. Because the glove is designed to receive the life of another. We are designed not to operate on our own. We are designed to be filled with the life of another, namely the Holy Spirit. Or Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, that's how we're designed to live. Now, uh, so that's nice, Larry, but what does that have to do with prayer? <laughs> well, everything. Okay? Everything. Um, remember that we said that prayer is uh, an awareness of need, a realization of divine adequacy, and an expectation that the Father will meet our need, will come and meet with us, okay? Um, it is interesting. I think most of us, most of the time, live our lives like, yeah, you know, okay, I can handle this. You know, I can drive the car. 
I can open the door for my wife. You know, I can do these things. Most of us have this feeling that we're adequate to face most of life. But it's really interesting. When we come up against something, like maybe the doctor told you you have cancer, or maybe your wife says she wants a divorce, or maybe your boss tells you, hey, thanks a lot, but we really can't use you anymore. Here's your last paycheck. Goodbye. What is our natural response when we come up against things like that? Yeah, you fight it, right, Ben? Yeah. What is our natural response? We pray. We run to the Father and pray, right? When something happens like that, the natural thing for us to do is to pray and to reach out to our brothers and sisters and ask them to pray. Okay? We see it all the time in the prayer team. We get all these messages and texts and emails to pray for this person and pray for that person because that's the natural response when we come up against it, when we know we're not adequate to face this. And if God doesn't show up and help us, we're dead. So what does this have to do with prayer? Everything. Everything. Because prayer is the way that we apprehend God. Prayer is the way that we come face to face with God and, and deal with him face to face. Deal with him in fellowship. Not just prayer. Yes, sometimes it's prayer. Sometimes it's, it's thanksgiving. Sometimes it's, it's praying for somebody else. But all of it is coming to him. Him. He wants to bless our lives. Okay? Now, Bench talked about some of the questions about prayer, and we're not going to address those head on, but, but whatever those questions are, God is sovereign, yes, but God wants us to come to him and pray. You know, we walk around like, okay, no problem, God's sovereign, you know, okay, I, it's cool, God will... No, God wants us to have fellowship with himself. God doesn't want our behavior. God doesn't want our correct theology. So much of what God wants is our hearts. And God will put us in situations where we have to go to him. Go back to 2 Corinthians, if you don't mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure and jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are simple vessels, clay pots, if you will. God is the treasure in the pot. And then in verse 11, Paul says, For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. In other words, God is putting us in situations where we have to cry out to him. Because he wants us to cry out to him. So he can be the life in us. So prayer is the way we apprehend God. We come face to face with God. And if you think about it, that is a stunning thing. The sovereign God, who knows every molecule in the universe, and me, who doesn't know much at all, can come face to face with this creator, who's not just the creator God. He's my father. He's my father. And he delights for me to come and delights for me to pray and delights to answer my prayers. In fact, he's the one that draws me to pray for things he's already prearranged to bless me with. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's incredible. So, um, so, we've been yappering on now for a good 45 minutes. And so um, i like us to, a little practicum here, okay? Um, i like us to take a few minutes 
And what I'd like us to do is to pray. Marvelous concept, class on prayer, prayer. Um, what I want us to do is I want us to take a few minutes. We're going to take about 10 minutes. I want us not to hurry. I want us not to just rush through. I want us to pray. And I want us to pray about one thing. We can pray about lots of things. Okay? Our sister Elizabeth is in the hospital tonight. Is she still there, Audrey? Probably, yeah. She's, you know, had a heart problem. We have other things to pray for. That's all good. But tonight, we want to start at the heart of prayer, the core of prayer, which is you and your father. And I want to, us to go to prayer for about, for about 10 minutes. And I want you to pray about your walk with God and your prayer life. Are you fainting? Then you're not praying. Are you praying? Then you won't be fainting. Or, but if I'm praying, but I'm fainting, I must not be really praying. So let's take about 10 minutes, please. And I want you just to be quietly by yourself, bow your heads or whatever, and just let's go to God individually, just ourselves, before God, and let's pray about that for about 10 minutes. <laughs> 